didn't begin to talk or even tell you let the suspense build. I'm not aware of what you've had presentations on before. I do not know you. So like many of my clients, I've, I've been there 20 something years. So they're like my family. But I would like to know what you all would like to achieve. You have a nutrition goal. Do you mind getting a piece of paper and writing it down? And we won't go over smart goals, but I just would like to have some talk at the end of what it is you want to achieve. And hopefully we can learn from each other and that maybe some people could be the support coach for someone over on that side of town. Um, but what do you want to do? You know, first of all, is it reasonable? And then identify the barriers what successes you've had in the past to achieve this, and what is your motivational level, okay? Um, on a scale of, let's say, one to five, five meaning, woohoo, I am there. One, like, I'll talk to you next year about it. So if everybody would just do that. And I wanna know, and again, you can say these out loud, and um, or you could put it in the chat, but what are some obstacles to change? Okay, motivation for one. I think that's what I hear a lot. And I think we all know if we're in a new relationship or coming out of a relationship, that is worth a, at least a 10 or 15 pound swing in our weight. Um, and then it's sometimes just our perceived value for that change. It's boring, whatever to do that, it's just so boring. I don't wanna do it because it's boring or a perceived time expenditure to do it, perceived costs. Maybe we just don't know how to do it or have the opportunity to do it. And then even our own belief system. So these are things I've heard or, and when I'm meeting with clients, these are some of the reasons I, I get for change. And, and I, I'm right there with you all, you know, when it comes to change, it's not easy. But I always say I'm the captain of my ship. <laughs> I'm the ultimate responsibility for what sales and what does not and how beautiful the sales are and when they're not so I'm I'm the one um so I wonder if anybody and I could if I could get some head nods or some idea and, and did anybody see Todd Brown Dr. Todd Brown's presentation the other day on HIV and aging I'm hearing seeing Jeff did I don't know if anybody else did I'm not seeing a lot of head nods Oh, good, good. Mary did. Um, I don't know if anybody else. I thought it was great. And I felt like it sort of segued way into what I had prepared to talk about. And for those of you who did not know, uh, his presentation was HIV and aging. And he, you know, started off talking about chronological age versus our biological age, you know, like our age in years versus the wear and tear on our body and, and how we feel and the physical function gap, how we can measure that by hand grip, our gait speed. And I've seen it also just how quickly do we get ourselves up out of a chair? And also I think we could add to that, even our balance, do we have balance? Can we stand on one leg? And he talked about the pathophysiology all of all of that is not being able to clear our free radicals. And free radicals is another, you know, reactive oxygen species. And these are things that are produced in the body, just in the body's natural processes of conducting business. He talked about telomeres. Have you heard about telomeres, anybody? But these are like specific DNA protein structures. And they're found, they're found at the end of our chromosome. So you can think of that like the plastic caps on the end of shoelaces. And they're really there to protect um, the, the DNA integrity. But as each process is happening, these telomeres can get shorter and shorter. And if that's happening, then um, it can undergo senescence or actually cell death. And then that cell doesn't, that DNA isn't functioning anymore. So when telomere short, we then can put us at higher risk of cancers and things of that nature as well. So what I got out of this is that, you know, and also just by better choice of diet, 
and activities, we can affect our telemark health. But what I got out of this is that, wow, we need antioxidants in our system. And I, I just love it that my presentation kind of leads into that. Now, I put staying young as we age is my title. And that made me think of green bananas. So that's why the green bananas are up there. Um, you know, they're looking pretty good when they're that way, but they can start to age. And so I want to keep, I want to keep green bananas. And uh, if you all get a shout out to my brother, he is 63 years of age today. Happy brother Ed. I'll tell him he has like 24 new friends. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, just wish him a happy birthday. Now, a lot about what we're going to talk about is that too, that we want antioxidants and um, because that also can lead to anti-inflammation and we have a way to treat all that. He talked about multimorbidities, you know, meaning uh, like heart disease, cholesterol, we'll put that as cholesterol, hypertension, diabetes, prediabetes, chronic kidney disease, osteoporosis, cancers. A lot of these as we're aging, we see this. And I think we've read, you've read that, you know, sometimes in HIV, we see these maybe before the general population when it comes to age, that might be chronologic age versus biologic age. One thing to know that, you know, excess weight and sedentary lifestyle, and I'm not saying it gets anybody on, the, on this call, but if if it is you, if it's someone you know, maybe you could help be the nudge. You could be the educator for them that these are the strongest drivers of, you know, weight gain, poor diet, lack of exercise to get the excess weight, which then excess weight can lead us into pre-diabetes and diabetes, which then can lead us into chronic kidney disease if it's not taken care of which the diabetes can lead us into more heart disease. Um, and then, you know, overall inflammation in the body. And this can be caused by HIV. We have inflammation, we have age-related inflammation, the inflammation we just talked about as with chronic diseases. So here's a, a little slide about, you know, if there's one thing I just wish I could talk to you a little bit. <laughs> Has everybody heard of inflammation? You, you, you've heard of that? And, and we pretty much know, thank you, Bob, it's not a good thing. It just isn't. You know, when we have a little cut on our hand, yes, we need that little inflammatory response. But when it goes uncontrolled, that is just like a big stick whacking everything inside of it. So, you know, these chronic diseases, obesity, diabetes, we have an infection, an injury, that can lead to inflammation, but also the inflammation adds to all these other diseases that we can get in, in infections into our mouth, oral health, cardiovascular, macular degeneration, joint pain, certain cancers, balance, balance, uh, inflammatory bowel diseases, asthma, Alzheimer's, arthritis. So what I got out of there, we got to stop inflammation. We've got to stop inflammation. We've got to stop this rampant run of free radicals in our system. Okay, everybody with me? Okay, I hope that yawn wasn't because you're bored. <laughs> okay. All right, so who knew that poor diet is the leading cause of premature death and disability? If we eat poorly, we can get all those other conditions we just saw, and that can lead to disability. Um, obesity, type 2 diabetes, all of this contributes to comorbidity and mortality, and cardiovascular disease, and a lot more. And then what we do know, too, is that the DASH diet, the Mediterranean diet, and vegetarian diets have the most evidence for cardiac, cardiovascular disease prevention and weight loss and more. Is that a surprise to anybody? I'm hearing some nods. Okay. Feel free to unmute yourself if you want. I'm okay with that. And then you can be mute. So what we're going to talk about. Um, 
we need to get rid of the oxidative stress because that impacts the way our body behaves and shortening telomeres and all of that other stuff. So I want to talk about intermittent fasting. Has anybody heard of that? Intermittent fasting. Okay, I hear a nod. Um, anybody want to mute themselves and just share a little bit about what you've heard? Not yet? Okay. We're going to talk about some healthy eating plans. We're going to talk about mindful eating and then a discussion. I am pretty sure we've all been around the block. We've heard the news about what we need to do to eat right, stave off disease prevention, slow down the aging process. But I really want to know what prevents us if we're not doing that. What does stop us? And that's part of the discussion I want to have at the end. This is not rocket science stuff, although intermittent fasting is pretty, pretty fascinating. Um, let me go there. I'm sorry, I'm going to keep, try to keep track of my notes at the same time. So intermittent fasting, it is eating pattern that switches between times of eating and times of fasting. Does anybody know anybody who's done this? Have you done it? No, I hear a lot of, oh, I hear Mary. Mary, do you want to unmute yourself and say anything? I'm okay with that. You're going to get bored listening to me. <laughs> well, the intermittent fasting, you shorten the, the time that you eat. Right. Um, like, right. Uh, right. and then fasting is a, it's pretty scheduled and people do it. They, they won't eat till like 11 o'clock and then they have more restrictions and, uh, you know, we can get pretty kinky with all this stuff. That's okay. So I was going to say, did you think they were crazy when they did it? <laughs> like, no, I get pretty crazy. Hey, okay. <laughs> I will have to say that I did this years ago and I, could, I didn't realize what it was called. I wasn't a nutrition man. But at that time, it was really a way I controlled my weight. Um, I come from a uh, meat and potato people who are not known to be tall and slim. Um, but it was a way for me to manage my weight, and I felt great. And um, so we're going to talk about the different approaches to this. Because I can share with you the different approaches. I'll do that first, and then we'll talk about the benefits. And you're going to um, maybe change your mind about a few things. So there's different approaches. So there's the daily approach where one does restrict daily eating to one six to eight hour period each day. So maybe you're eating for eight hours and you're fasting the other. And we're going to tell you why this is really helpful later in a moment. So this clock shows that this person is chose to eat something like Mary said. They're eating from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Okay, And then they're fasting until 10 a.m. the next morning. I, right now, I'm in my third day of doing it, and I have chose, I'm an early riser, um, and I, I just couldn't wait till 10. I would probably uh, bite the head off of somebody. Uh, so I eat around 6.30 and eat, stop feeding around 4. So that, that's been my pattern. Um, the next one is the 5 to 2 approach. So you eat regularly five days a week. And then for the other two days, you limit yourself to one meal, maybe a five or 600 calorie meal. And maybe this is the goal of getting there after you've been doing this a while. Maybe you start out the first time of doing uh, one, one meal, one day a week of this really light meal, okay? And then you eventually graduate to something that resembles more of this, but it's a small meal, five to 600 calorie meal. And then there's the every other day where you fast one day and eat regularly the other day. So there's different ways to, to do it. And they've all um, kind of had similar results with weight loss. But I just want to go over the benefits of just this whole idea in particular, but a little bit about what's actually going. You know, our body uses glucose as one of its major fuels plus fat. And our brain really likes glucose. So we're, when we're in the fed stage, we are putting 
fuel for the brain in terms of glucose or putting our excess into our piggy bank, a fat source. When you go into the fasting mode, you are actually drawing on your fat to feed the brain and your other cells. So, does that make sense? All right, so the benefits of this, and I just wanna read a few things, because if you'll keep in mind, Dr. Todd was talking about, we need to clear free radicals. We need to eliminate this inflammation as two gigantic things that the body needs. And when the body is in this fasting state, meaning using ketones to supply its energy, we are actually reducing free radical production we suppress inflammation. Um, we repair things. We have more time for cellular repair. Oh, I'm trying to think. Uh, glucose regulation improves. It increases stress resistance. It reduces marker of systemic inflammation and oxidative restress. Um, so actually, by going into this fasting state, you're allowing your body more time to do the repair that it doesn't otherwise have. Because we're kind of that three meals a day and snack. So by limiting the time, you're actually increasing the lifespan. Now that particular study was mostly in rodents because we, it's hard for us to tell that. There's a lot of variables. But in rat models, they increased the lifespan by about 80% when they did intermittent fasting with the rat over those who ate regularly. Obesity and type 2 diabetes, there was weight loss, reduced weight circumference, improved insulin sensitivity, and reduction in diabetic retinopathy. That's the eye disease. Heart disease and atherosclerosis. Sclerosis. They improved blood pressure, resting heart rate, Cholesterol levels lower, triglyceride levels lower, inflammation was improved just two to four weeks after starting. Cancer, it can slow growth cancer cells because again, if you've got something not shortening your telomeres, but something that's helping your telomeres stay long or grow, then you're gonna reduce your risk of cancers as well. Asthma, multiple sclerosis, arthritis, all inflammatory diseases, um, neurodegenerative diseases, also stroke, alcohol, they all improve those conditions as well. So cells respond to intermittent fasting by gazing, I'm going to just read this, I'm sorry, in a coordinated adaptive stress response that leads to increased expression of antioxidants, DNA repair, protein quality growth or protein quality control, mitochondrial biogenesis, which is the energy, our little cells that produce our energy, and they downregulate inflammation. And again, they inhibit this enzyme that cancer cells need to live. So basically it's killing the cancer cell. So, intermittent fasting. I'd really like to have the mic off and just uh, your mics are on and just see can this, anybody have any questions? I'd like to hear your impression about it. Do you think this could be beneficial for you? Go ahead um, and unmute yourself if you'd like to make a comment. I know earlier when we were talking about this, a couple of people had their hands up. So feel free to uh, unmute yourself and comment if you like. Does anybody feel this has benefits? that might help with something that's going on in your life? No? I'm a little shy. <laughs> well, one added benefit I found about this is <laughs> not even regards to, um, you know, sometimes I, I, I take my shower and I, I'm so tired to brush my teeth. I don't want to do it because I'm afraid it'll wake me up. But now I'm brushing my teeth right after my four o'clock meal, and I find that is a big perk. <laughs> so I'm I know the benefits I got from this when I did it in weight management, and I had great cholesterol then. I had I had very low blood pressure. Um, but anyway, does it seem like crazy? Well, yeah, Jim. 
Is this research based or yes. is it supported by anecdotal evidence only? It's research based. What research? Research based. And I can give some citations for it if you like. I'll send them to Jeff. They've been doing these studies actually a really long time in animals and humans are doing them now currently. Um, this was a, a new, new England Journal of Medicine article. You can, so, you know, New England Journal of Medicine, I think people. Are you able to hear me? Oh, I can I, now. Yeah. Um, thank you for your input and your inspiration. Uh, I find I find it pretty easy to fast for the first part of the day and almost impossible not to eat or snack or get a tablespoon of peanut butter or something like that as bedtime arrive, uh, get, draws near. And the, the inability, I mean, the, the inability to control myself is embarrassing. Uh, and I feel like, well, hell, I, I did pretty well today. And uh, now those Oreos that I locked away in the bottom cupboard so I wouldn't eat them are gone. And uh, how do you how do you stop eating at six p.m.? Uh, I mean, Oprah talked about this as being one of the hardest things for her. But nighttime eating and nighttime binging and thinking, okay, I can uh, I can just eat two Oreos and then the, the whole sleeve is gone. <laughs> and and, um, and and I'd like other people to contribute. And and granted, you know, people when they start this. You're gonna feel hungry. Uh, I mean, I I really only did it. I mean, my this will be my fourth night. Only I mean, one night did I really feel hungry. But so, and this may not be for everybody because sometimes people just need a new way to reach their goal. And whether it is a weight management, because maybe this brings more of a challenge to someone, or they've got all these metabolic issues that this can address. Um, I know. In the past, when I did it, I I just went to bed. You know, I just went to bed if I was hungry. And I would just say to myself, no, there's people all over the world going to bed hungry. Now, you know, just do it. Get over it, you know. So, um, and, I, and I think it's helpful not to have those kinds of foods in the house. So I, I'm replacing, you know, I love to bake, but I thought, okay, I'm going to save that for special conditions. But even though when I did it in the past, I would have sweets during the day. I did moderate what I ate, though. I didn't eat as much as you know I could. Um, and we're going to talk about mindful eating in the moment. That might be another technique to help identify what's going on. Um, but I, Bob, I appreciate your, your your feedback. But does anybody have some ideas for Bob? A bike lock on the refrigerator or something I was thinking. <laughs> hi, hi, this is Christopher. I'm the same way. I needed like a little something sweet at night. And for a long time, I was on the all chocolate all the time diet, you know. And uh, so I switched like to carrots and grapes that um, to me, the carrots have a sweet flavor also, but definitely the grapes. And, um, you know, like I've found resources like the 99 cent only store that will have produce at reasonable prices. So I yeah. can, so I can eat this stuff as though it were potato chips, but it doesn't have the same impact, you know, or like cookies. But I do find that um, I get satiated that way. And for me eating at night, I take my medicine then. So um, it's not just that I feel hungry, hungry psychologically, but my stomach might be churning from processing the medication. So, um, um, I especially notice you take vitamins at night, your stomach can start to grumble because they really need that stomach acid to help be absorbed. I think, um, you know, if there's a possible way to change your medication to the morning, you, need, you know, this idea is, and I'm sure you thought of that, because there is some science to say eating at night is just like one of the worst things we can do to help manage our weight. You know, it's really stopping. The kitchen closes at six o'clock and you know, and we want to examine how did we during the day, did we do do well? And that might mean keeping a food flow for a few days or even a week. 
because what we think we did and what they really did, boy, it can be polar opposites, you know. But writing it down, it's kind of proof of the pudding. And and if you're looking for weight loss, one of the common themes in people who were, took weight and kept it off for many, many years was keeping a food journal. Then they actually moved. So, do you have a, a guideline on uh, caloric intake and uh, any in, in, in insights on uh, the keto fad? Well, guidelines on weight for weight loss, of course, it's just the idea we have to take in less calories than we're burning. Mm -hmm. And we might, you know, I think we need to acknowledge that as we get older, our metabolic rate of our, our rate of calorie burn goes down unless we are able to sustain our muscle mass, our lean body mass. And, we, and, and as we get older, sarcopenia can you know, come about, and that means we're losing muscle. Our weight may not change, but we, you know, our composition of the weight has changed. And if we lose lean body mass or muscle, we don't burn as many calories. It's like you went from a 450 engine in the old days down to a 350 engine. And you're not burning as many calories, but we've had these decades or habits, years of habits of eating X amounts of food, but we are more sedentary than we used to. And if we're not doing the weight bearing exercise to promote muscle mass, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard thing to keep manage and maintain the weight. Even now, I know that I need to keep my protein intake high. Because I, you know, I protein synthesis has got to happen during the span. So I've got to, you know, make sure I'm getting enough during my eating hour. And now that I'm older, I have to really pay attention to that. Did that answer your question? Or? Yeah, that I, I hadn't thought of that, but uh, after a year of being away from the gym, a loss of muscle mass impacts the number of calories burned. Um, I was trying to do keto to catch up. It, it seemed okay. that I did really well, and then just kaboom, uh, everything. Yeah. And, and everything. keto, a lot of people believe in it. They feel, you know, that because it's a low carb, um, and, and and obviously people feel like they have mental clarity when they're eating less carbs. And I think it's because most of us eat the wrong carbs and too much of the carbs. I mean, we, when we're going to look at two other types of diets that you know they have carbohydrates in them, but they're mostly focusing on not the starchy carbs, not, not the processed carbs. And that's, you know, we, we just have to remember we live in a society that the bottom line is financial. And your manufacturers are gonna promote all this stuff and we really have to turn an eye to that and just stick with what we know. And we're gonna talk about that. I, mean, I know you're, it's not, not gonna be a surprise, but if ketogenic diet works for you, sometimes they say not to do it forever um, because I'm just curious if your cholesterol, your LDL is going up or not. You know, that cholesterol. All right, we'll move on. And I thank you all who, who have shared. I, I, I really appreciate that. So we're going to talk a little bit about plant-based meals. And sometimes people think, oh, that it's just so boring. <laughs> Um, but I don't know, can you look at that and go, that's boring? I, I, I cannot. But um, again, plant-based, if we're going to try to get in all those anti-inflammatory foods, all those antioxidants, repair everything that's going on in uh, these metabolic diseases and aging, we, for many of us, we have to make some changes to what we're eating. And again, you are the captain of your ship. You're gonna make that decision um, and, and we're responsible for those decisions. You know? I mean, who else is? So these were named the three best meal plans. And one is the DASH diet, been around a long time. Everyone's familiar. Dietary approaches to stop hypertension because it does lower blood pressure if you follow it. People had weight loss on it. Um, the Mediterranean diet, which they're very similar, and the vegetarian diet, and I understand that can mean a lot of different things to most people, but we're mostly talking plant-based, <clears throat> pardon me, because these plants really can promote health and prevent chronic disease, 
if we already have them, we can certainly help it along by again stopping the free radical damage, lowering the inflammation in our body, which is just two huge, huge problems. So, because of plant based meal patterns, we get all these things we call phytochemicals, antioxidants, anti inflammatory, antimicrobial properties, anti tumor, increased nitric, nitric oxide, which means it's increasing our vagal dilation, so it helps with blood pressure issues. Fiber, oh my God, cannot tell you enough about fiber. Pass the butyrate, please. And butyrate is a short chain fatty acid, which is the end product of fiber metabolism and that impacts your microbiome and you know so you've heard probably a lot about you know the microbiome and how can we repair it how can we make it better um, but it also all these properties anti-inflammatory anti-cancer even colorectal cancer fiber provides satiety <laughs> plant-based provides satiety. So that can actually help us manage our weight, you know, if we're listening. And again, we'll talk to that about that. And then it's just a kinder thing to our you know, there's less resources utilized and if we can try to get organic and I have bought organic at the 99 cent store, so happy when I see it, I overbuy and that's bad, but <laughs> All right, so, I don't want to get a hook up on all the polyphenols and the flavonoids and the catechins, but just knowing that there's these properties in plants and, and food that produces all these wonderful effects. So fruit and vegetables, onions, parsley, kale, tea, berries, soy, dark chocolate. They say limited to you know 100 grams, which is three ounces a week. Try to get the darkest, so it has the least amount of sugar citrus, grapes, peaches, broccoli, lettuce, and you see there's an overlap. We also canolic catechins, um, and I just need to read some of this stuff, but basically it just helps with all of the things that are going on, heart health, diabetes, LDL, all of that stuff. So again, this I don't think is reinventing the wheel. It's just like, if we're not doing it, how do we move towards that? Do we have value to do that? Because the evidence says it's helpful, it, it, it works. So what's, what stops us from doing it if we're not there? So the DASH diet again, it's high fruits and vegetables and I can give you very specific amounts at, a, at another day, I just lumped it all the general list. Low fat dairy, whole grain. This is where a lot of people, you know, fall for too. Lean protein, fish, avoid sugar. Does everybody know about the added sugars? You've seen those on the new food label. Do you know how to convert grams of added sugars to teaspoons of sugar? We can talk about that because that's a really important thing that I want you all to know how to do before we leave this call. Again, manufacturers want your money. <laughs> they will put sugar into everything. I opened up a can of red kidney beans. I love eating red kidney beans straight from the can. And I took a spoonful, you know, this has been some while back, and they were sweet. Red kidney beans, generic, not even a brand name, red kidney beans. And I thought, what the heck? And sure enough, I flip it over and I look at the ingredients because that's where you find kernel mustard with the library, or in the library with the red. That's where you find that kind of information in the ingredients. And there they had added sugar. Sugar to my beans. Now, why did they do that? Any guesses? I'm cynical. I know they just want my money. And most of us like sweet. So we're not even, Christopher, were you going to say something? I was just going to say um, to get you hooked as though um, sugar is addictive. Yes, you're right. And, and then, then, you know, their stockholders are making money off of us. The need to be there, and they're adding it to everything salad dressings, everything, it's in everything. So, read the ingredient list, look at those labels. Um, but you want to avoid sugar, your tropical oil. People think coconut is such a healthy thing, coconut oil. It's not, it raises our LDL cholesterol. It is not healthy, it's like 90 something percent saturated. So, don't buy into that. 
Um, and sodium, it has lowers the sodium to 2,300 milligrams a day, but if people lowered it even less to 1,500 milligrams, they saw even greater blood, blood pressure lowering. And if we keep our blood pressure down, um, we're going to save on our kidneys. High blood pressure can destroy our kidneys. Okay. Potassium rich foods, which you can get in all of these foods too, help dump sodium and that's safe on our kidneys. Okay. Potassium helps blood pressure. Sodium adds to blood pressure. High blood pressure kills the kidneys. Uncontrolled diabetes kills the kidneys. Okay. The Mediterranean diet, look at that. Fruit and vegetables, seven to 10 servings a day. Anyone close to that? Okay. Whole grains, legumes, beans, same thing, healthy fats, nuts, olive oil, moderate portions of dairy products that are not or low fat. Get the plain Greek yogurt. It's nice and thick. It can be used in so many substitutions. My father was a diabetic. He loved to eat sour cream with salsa in it and then with chips. Now, my father was blind from macular degeneration. So he did not know we were serving him plain Greek yogurt instead of the sour cream with the salsa in it. So just by doing that, we replaced the saturated bad fat. We added calcium, vitamin D, and protein and cut down the calories by getting a non-fat Greek yogurt. It was the winnest of wins. And that plain yogurt, Greek yogurt can be used in making salad dressings and so many other things. Just Google recipes for plain yogurt. You would be surprised if all the substitutions you can use that, but you're gonna get protein, which we need, calcium, which we need, and the vitamin D, and all, without the bad fat. Uh, the Mediterranean diet, fish a couple of times a week, little of any red meat, and we're cooking. You know, this is Southern Italy and Greece, so cooking with spices and herbs. They have an active lifestyle. They have a huge sense of community. So there's no one Mediterranean meal pattern, but it, this is the backbone of it. So again, plant-based, fruit, vegetables, and we can get more bang for our bite when we're eating the non-starchy non vegetables. You know, which, which, what do we call non-starchy vegetables? Can someone give me an example of those? Olives, eggplant. Is that here, eggplant? Eggplant. Eggplant, yes, eggplant. Green ones that grow above the ground. Green ones that grow above the ground. Anything more? Tomatoes. Tomatoes. Mm, parsley, all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, cucumbers. Think of a salad. Cucumbers, tomatoes, asparagus, mushrooms, onions, peppers, bell peppers, zucchinis, yellow squash, little patty pan squash. The starchy vegetables, there's nothing wrong with them. It's just that they're like three times as many calories for the same serving size. And mostly that's what people are putting on their plate, half a plate of heavy starch, vegetables, corn, peas, potatoes, and it should just be a fourth of a plate. Where our non-starchy has all the antioxidants and the fibers and vitamins and minerals and very low calorie. And again, that great sense of satiety, okay? We're feeling full, we're usually not Trying to put more food in, and that can come very quickly. I'm not a huge fan of a lot of salads. Why would I say that? What's what's the big calorie consumer or provider of salad? Oil, olive oil. What? Olive oil. Well, and just the fat, the fat in it. Hopefully, you can use an olive oil or an oil, but you know that's a, a tablespoon, which is about the size of your thumb. That's 100 calories, 100 calories. You can eat two cups of vegetables for 100 calories. So if you're gonna have a salad as part of a way to keep your weight off, and I, I get those once, my friend from the 99 cent store, those $1.99 ones, 
I never use all that dressing, but I love the fact that they chop those pieces tiny because a little bit of dressing goes a really long way when you've got little tiny pieces of salad. If you got big chunks of lettuce, you know, that dressing hits the top two pieces, everything's naked underneath, and you're constantly adding this high calorie dressing. Uh, but salad can be great. Add all kinds of stuff to it. You could add your nuts, you could add your legumes, get a great healthy meal full of antioxidants, full of anti-inflammatory properties. Okay. So things we need to avoid because they're just not healthy. Try to limit your red meat to as small as you can. Processed meats are even worse. The deli meats, cold cuts, things like that. And then the sausage bacon, they have been associated with the greatest increase in cardiovascular risk. First of all, they're high in salt. Um, we have talked a little bit about this. You've got to get rid of the trans fat. Instead of trans fat now, they're putting in all this palm oil and coconut oil, palm corn oil. They're not healthy and they're actually devastating habitats for, you know, like Siberian tigers and other things in the country, just so that we can have this kind of fat in our practice. Um, beverages with foods and added sugar. I sit with clients sometimes and half of their calories or more in a day come from beverages with sugar in it. And that's one thing people do not think about when they're trying to lose weight. But that's a goal of theirs to lose weight. They, they're not chewing it. They don't think about it having calories. And they have a lot of calories, a lot of added sugar, and sugar is inflammatory. Um, processed grains, white bread, pasta, white rice, get the whole grain. Get the whole grain because think of past the butyrate, please. The short chain fatty acids being made from that that works with so many body processes that are so good for us. Okay, any questions? Comments, snide remarks? Oh, I wrote side remark. I meant snide remarks <laughs> at this time. How are we doing? Okay, we're still there. Does anyone want to raise your hand? Do a little something to bring some oxygen to you. <laughs> All right. Mindful eating. Who's heard of this? Ooh. Anybody practice mindful eating? It's a really good topic during COVID, let me tell you. <laughs> I, I can't I think someone's talking, but I might I cannot hear very well. Did someone say something? Well, I, I will. Um, okay, thank so you, Stephen. I, I think by mindful eating, you're really talking about when you're eating, be aware that you're actually eating. Eat when you're hungry. Um, think about whether you're whether you're still hungry to decide whether you need eat, eat some more. Um, so you know, sort of be aware of what you're doing. Sort of, uh, um, yeah, sort of eat slowly, chew your food, enjoy your food. Um, enjoy it with friends if you can, and um, and have it be a, a pleasant part of your day. Excellent. I'm going to call on you when we give this class next. Um, <laughs> I, love the, I love the mindful eating class because it is what you talked about, and this it comes out of the concept of mindful nuts, which we can apply mindfulness to everything we do. I have a friend, he lives in the moment all the time, which means he never has a plan B, which drives me crazy, but he's living in the moment. And I practice that, I have to practice that. But mine, so even in this presentation, are we paying attention to this presentation? Or am I working on a grocery list or some other crossword puzzle? I got an, I, you know, and what am I all doing besides listening to this presentation because if we're not doing mindfulness and being in the moment why 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 are we bothering and and that's his his you know thought with that and i he, it's so true and when you're in the moment you cannot think about all those other stressors you might have going on because you're in the moment of whatever it is so stephen was right so, or was it stephen oh i think it's wrong um Pay attention to your hunger. 
You know, is it physical hunger? Meaning I can hear my stomach growling. And it isn't because the coffee you just drank, you know, it's because you're hungry. Or is it emotional hunger? You know, I, you're standing in front of the refrigerator, you're looking in the cupboards, and you're not hungry, but you are there. You're, you're looking. So is it emotional hunger or external hunger? Did you just see a commercial that, whoa, did that ever look good? And now you're, you're standing in the kitchen too. So we want to eat slowly and without distraction. We do. We want to enjoy our food. We want to use all of our senses. We want to chew 25 times. We wanted to hit every taste bud in our mouth. Exactly. Listen to your physical hunger cues while eating. Oh, am I still hungry? You know, we really need very little food to survive. So if we're eating until we're full, I think we did not pay attention to our hunger cues. If we can put our fork down somewhere and go, am I still hungry? And I think we know what hunger feels like, right? Not very pleasant. You know, you'll see me later tonight, maybe. <laughs> oh, not, I'm kind of hungry. I'm going to go to bed. Um, not very pleasant. But being full isn't very pleasant either. Would you agree with that? You just think, oh, God, can I make it to the couch before I, I just collapse here? You know, and I can't breathe. Engage your senses and appreciate the color, smells, texture, sounds, flavors, and even where the food comes from. Think about it. This bell pepper was a seed somewhere and someone nurtured it and harvested and got it to the supermarket and now it's on my plate. So if we can just appreciate where our food actually comes from. And this is a big thing. You reduce feelings of guilt and anxiety related to food, okay? Even if, you have a piece of chocolate cake. You've committed to it. You're going to enjoy every single bite of that. You're going to chew slowly. You're going to chew 25, you know, times. You, you know, and assess for hunger. Maybe you don't need to finish it all because you've assessed for your hunger or your satisfaction. So have a little hunger scale here. Where one is ravenous, meaning, oh, don't anybody come in front of me because I'm not pleasant. I can even say that when I'm very hungry. Or 10, where you are painfully full. Thanksgiving Day, you had pie right after the big meal. You are, oh, devastated. Okay. Where we would like to be is in here, you know, neutral, satisfied, and light. Even you can even say I'm a little hungry, but right in here is where we should be stopping. And this involves putting the fork down, asking ourselves that question. It might mean setting a timer for 20 minutes. You've all heard, you know, you've got to, your brain needs 20 minutes to assess that you've eaten. So when we're really, really, really hungry, we put in so much food that, you know, assessing hunger is out the window. So while we're eating, set that timer. When you're done, how much time is left on that clock? Can you improve upon it by a minute or two the next day? Until you're truly taking 20 minutes. And I'm going to bet you all that you're not going to finish the food on your plate. Okay? You're putting down your fork, chewing, biting, thinking about these things, assessing your hunger, you're probably not going to be able to finish your meal. Which is totally fine. Because we don't want waste. W-A-S-T-E to go to the W-A-I-S-T. So that's a good thing. We saran it up. We put it in the refrigerator. We've saved money. We've saved on our waistline. And we, we feel okay. So kind of like Stephen was talking about. Am I hungry when I eat? Where am I when I eat? COVID. Many people were home. Did they go? Do you find yourself eating in front of the television? You find yourself eating in your car? How, how can you be mindful if, it, if those things are going on while you're eating? I encourage you all to have a nice spot on your table. Throw off all that stuff. Set a nice setting. Put a plate there. Silverware, everything, so you cannot set something down on that. And that, that you have a place to go away from those distractions to eat. And I have to tell you, I am guilty of this because we have a lot of work. <laughs> and... 
I'm eating my lunch, but this is on my list now. And I finished something. It was a, a tangerine or something I peeled. And I was looking for it, looking everywhere. And I had finished it and did not realize I, I had finished it. Now, do you think I enjoyed that? I have no clue. I don't even remember eating it. So why did I even bother? You know, did you think I assessed hunger at that moment? No, didn't do any of those. So, am I eating out of a box or a sack? You know, if you're ordering, because there was a lot of free delivery during COVID, people ordered terrible stuff, and they're eating out of a box and a sack, please, please do not. Please put it on that plate, on your beautiful plate setting, away from the distractions, and eat and doing all of those things, you know, assessing hunger, looking at it, thinking about it, just being one with this meal. Are you using utensils? Utensils, even if you're eating pizza, it's gonna slow you down. Even if you're eating burgers and fries, cut it up. Reminds me of the Seinfeld episode. Who was a Seinfeld fan? Seinfeld? Okay, do you remember the one where George was cutting up the candy bar with the fork and knife? In a board meeting. Oh God, you missed an episode. <laughs> well, anyway, it drew stares and looks, but it can slow you down. You got to cut it. You put down your utensils. You pick it up and you eat it. Versus just rolling that pizza and shoving it in. Cut it with a knife and fork. Am I done in less than twenty minutes? And can I say that I'm still hungry halfway through the meal? If I cannot say that I am, stop eating eat it later before your fasting begins okay saved on your budget saved on everything all right any questions about mindful eating no okay okay i'm at seven i will a little bit of a little bit about activity because a activity can help with all of these health issues helps with our brain health um, but sitting is now the new smoking so i don't know if anybody smokes you know who you are if you do um, I could, if you are, you know, please let's think of a quit date for you. But physical, physical inactivity, six, 10% of deaths from diseases, including heart disease, diabetes, breast cancer, and colon cancer. It's almost the same number of deaths as tobacco. But doing this physical activity, and they really, our best goal would be 60 to 75 minutes a day of moderate intensity can eliminate a lot of our health. Okay, so think about if you're not doing something now, what can you do? There, if we're trapped in the house, there are so many things on the television. Oh my gosh, you could be doing the activity 24 seven. So what, what's the step to get you there? And this is just showing health benefits is really in this, where they're recommending the 150 to 300 minutes a week. And you know, if it's, if it's a slow walking, fine, but try to speed it up. Remembering they're measuring physical function by our gait speed. And there's studies out there that people who walk really slow don't tend to live as well or as long. So try to increase your gait speed. And that only comes with you know, increasing your muscle mass too. So how can you do that? Weight bearing exercise, squats, anything, put a backpack on your back with stuff in it, do your squats or lunges. Go upstairs, go downstairs. Strategies for a healthier liver. This is my so summary. So like, what can we commit to? So try to be active. Does not mean we need a gym membership, but just must not be sitting around. Less couch time, less sedentary activity. Make a quick date if you smoke. One, one, oh, there's one of my feral cats. One day a week, swap a plant protein for red meat or processed meats if you're doing that. Avoid late night snacking. Okay. <laughs> so if you're fueling well, good fiber and all those other stuff, hopefully we can get to that. And don't forget your hydration. I did not put a my plate meal or pattern in here, but have you all seen my plate? It's the nine inch plate that they divide up into sections. I always like the, the one whole half section is your non-starchy veggie. And I love that plate. And I think if we can try to model our eating after that plate, we're only gonna get healthier. 
because it's nine inch. That's that's the size of dinner or salad plates in most dishware now today. So I can see something that's fine my age. Eight ounces was the biggest glass then. Now you know they're this big. The juice glasses are bigger than it's a three servings of juice with the size of the juice glasses. So get that nine inch plate out on your lovely place setting. No matter what your food or where it comes from, put it in the, the section. Where's your protein? Where's your whole grain? Does half my plate have half the non-starchy vegetables on it? I can sprinkle my fruit and the calcium, vitamin D things throughout the day. I find that um, meal planning is a huge. We, most of us plan for everything, right? You, you know what you're gonna watch on TV tonight, maybe know what you're gonna to do tomorrow, but not so many of us plan our meals. And without doing that, a lot of unhealthy things can happen to us, okay? So meal planning is huge, can save money, can, can avoid food waste, and we eat better. And I want you to learn something new for your brain. They say when we learn something new for our brain, that is like exponential growth in the brain. So I've committed to taking singing lessons when we can start up again. Cannot sing, I want to sing, but I'm gonna take singing lessons. So I want you to think about what's one new thing you can learn. I had a client, he learned to crochet, he made us all beautiful bags, he learned to knit. The last thing he was doing, he was learning to sew. So he was engaging his brain constantly and learning new things. So we have to do the same and exercising too. Just crossing our hemispheres creates wonderful growth in our brain. So we've got to be moving our body as well. Sleep. Who's not getting at least seven hours of sleep a night? Don't be embarrassed. <gasps> Great job. Okay, we have to work on that. We have to... I don't. I, I would love for us all to have a discussion as to why that is and what what possible things you could do to get yourself to bed. If you're not, please please put that on the top priority for yourself. Again, the body needs this recovery time, so adequate sleep. Um, and talk to Dr. Brown. He added a few things also to continue also on how to beat inflammation. He talked about how we might have an undetectable viral load, but we might not be taking our meds 100% of the time. So we really needed to do that, and that would be our goal, take our meds 100% of the time if we're not. Maintain a normal weight. And normal is kind of crazy, but it's mostly like, what's a desirable weight or what's a healthy weight? What's, what would be a healthy weight? And we have to put it in perspective, you know, that. My, my size, the height really hasn't changed much. It has for me because I went to menopause, but you know, is our weight too much for our poor skeletal bone, okay? And it doesn't have to be a lot of weight loss if that's, and that's where we need to go because five, 10% is a big improvement in your health outcome. So five or 10% can be a huge improvement in health outcome. And if we just become more fit, more physically fit, that's like a leap year also in health and health. Okay. Um, he said, cut down on alcohol, avoid drugs. You have hep C, get it cured. And mental, dental health. You know, before COVID, I think we were frequently going to the doctors, but I hope you were going to the dentist that often as well. Um, oral health, you know, this is oral health. Oh, last month was oral health cancer month. And I just want to say my sweetheart, Hadn't gone to the dentist in 10 years. When he, when then we realized there is something wrong, he had an HPV on his tonsils that went to his jaw. He had to have chemo, radiation. He was on a feeding tube for a year and a half and he still isn't eating real food. But I know if he'd been going to the dentist, they would have seen that long before it advanced to that stage. So please if, make sure you're going to the dentist as well. This is as you would your medical doctor. Okay, I would like mics on mute if possible. If anybody wants to share something that they're working on, do you have a, a, a plan to get there? Do you want to make an action plan in front of all of us? And maybe someone, you know, would call you and see how you're doing with that. And, you know, anybody?
my fitness pat my fitness pal okay um, go ahead am, am i able to be heard uh-huh um my okay. fitness pal i was on their you're cutting okay. up Bob. Uh, We seem to have lost you. We're just hearing the cat now. <laughs> I can't hear you, Bob. He was having trouble earlier. Oh, okay. Bob, um, we're not able to hear you. You're talking. We see you talking, but um, we can't hear you. It's nothing about my fitness pal, and, and there are a lot of apps out there. If you're an app person, to help help you, and I applaud you that for those who do use them. Anybody want to share a goal or something you're working on, trying to achieve, or if you're having trouble? Well, I'll tell you some of mine then. <laughs> um, I am doing intermittent fasting. I started Saturday, so pat myself on the back. Okay, I'm doing quite well. I have not fudged, even though there are times when I can see just, I normally would walk by and nibble on something and, and no, for no reason. You know, it's those BTLs, those bites taste of licks that add up to calories. Um, I'm not doing the exercise I used to do. So I am starting to ride my bike to work. Uh, that 16 mile round trip and it's a little hairier now with COVID in that car situation but I can still find you know some routes that keep me off of the main drag most of the time so I was doing it one day a week I am this week starting to do it two days a week so um, I'll ride my bike to work tomorrow and I'm going to ride it to Santa Monica which is another 16 mile round trip on one day of the weekend so that's my goal that I will uh, stay on this, you know, um, intermittent fasting. I plan to do it, I'll just say five days a week because they never say do every day because we want to make sure we can do it. And um, my confidence level of that is a seven for sure. And I'm going to ride my bike twice a week, one day to work, or if not two days to work, one day to the Santa Monica and one day to work. That's my plan. Okay. And it's just, I know I'll feel better about myself. And to me, that's huge. I'm hoping for a better uh, weight outcomes, um, but I just, I'll, I'll, I'll feel better about myself. We did have a few questions earlier on in the chat that I wanted to, okay. to bring up. Um, a couple of people asked about diabetes and one asked about balancing dietary restrictions around multiple comorbidities like diabetes too kidney disease, liver disease, kidney stones, high blood pressure, and so on, for 30 years of HIV and the medications. So, you know, for older folks like us who have more, <laughs> more going on, how do, you, how do you balance all those um, in terms of, you know, healthy eating? Well, I think one good thing, and I um, thank you for the question, and I, you know, I think one of these meal patterns can be a good idea for sure because again and the my plate model i love it because it actually control for diabetes it can control for our waistline it promotes a lot of fiber it doesn't promote too much um, non-starchy vegetables promote, promotes a calcium vitamin d you know whether it be milk or milk alternative or dairy and i think if you're eating well, some of the, a lot of those things are going to fall into place. Mm -hmm. So keeping that food record again as to what things are not helping you achieve that goal, because diabetes, there is no diet, diabetic diet. There is none. So you don't let people tell you, oh, you have to follow a diabetic diet. There is none. And that's the beauty of all of that. So it's not that you have to eat a different food than everybody else. It's all about what is the serving size versus what is the portion size I'm feeding myself. And that will turn into how much carbohydrate you're taking in versus how many calories you're getting in. So I would encourage you, if you're not following a Mediterranean diet, because both of those have proven to be helpful, 
maybe intermittent fasting is, is good for you so that during your, your time you're eating, you know, a my plate meal again. I think it's such a great model because it doesn't make things complicated. You could just look at what you're eating and say, ooh, did I get the protein? Did I get my non-starchy veggies? Where's my whole grain? If I got half a plate of meat and half a plate of potatoes, then, well, that's, that is not a my plate model, and that could explain why some of my issues. Again, it's making a behavior change. And, and do you find value in doing that? And I think as we age, to be able to maintain our independence, oh my gosh, you know, that is huge. Um, my mother's 89, still lives alone, still mows her lawn. But, you know, <laughs> to uh, open up a mayonnaise jar, whoa, oh, that's heavy. Or just to lift a mayonnaise jar, oh my God, that's so heavy. And I'm thinking, oh my God. But I'm seeing, you know, when I'm doing, oh, geez, so I've got one of those things you squeeze, you know, to improve your grip that make that sweet noise, sweet noise. Um, so it, it can happen and it, and it can happen without it. Think, I mean, it just happens, you know, so every day I think we really have to look at, am I doing what's necessary to keep me independent? And what is, if, what's one thing I can start with? You know, if we list all the things that need to change, oh my God, that's going to be paralysis. We won't just do anything. It'll be too overwhelming. We have to take one thing. And I think setting sometimes like, you know, the smart goals. How, what do I actually want to achieve? What is actually, am I able to do? Or what resources do I need to do that? Yeah, question there. Yeah, please, Christopher. Since you spoke about it, one of the goals I've had recently is to improve my sleep. And um, I recently bought an Apple Watch. And um, I bought it because of the fall detector that um, for as I age, you know, safety reasons, and I live alone. But I found that there's all sorts of um, great feedback information about sleep and about movement that um, are on these smart watches. So I'm not pushing Apple particularly, but it's a, <laughs> a smart watch. Okay. So um, I found that my sleep was much shorter than I thought. Um, it was telling me it was four and a half hours in January a night, which is like, I wouldn't have guessed that at all. But um, it also shows me um, that it's disrupted. So I've tried to um, recreate my um, sleeping atmosphere so that um, I'm less interrupted, um, where the fan blows and this kind of stuff, it blows in a different direction. Um, trying to do things, I drink less water near the end of the evening, so I'm not getting up to pee, you know. I only do it once instead of three times. <laughs> Very smart, that's great, that's, it's great, good, excellent. So, and, and now when you're doing that, is it saying you're sleeping more? It is the feedback about that, but um, I've also, like in maybe the last three weeks really determined that I need to improve this. Um, that I was feeling the lack of sleep and couldn't figure it out. And then when I started to look, it's like these patterns kind of revealed that I wasn't getting the support of sleep that I needed. And so, so since you implemented some of those changes, do you notice you are sleeping more? Yes, right. Because I'm put, I'm turning things off. I've moved like the television out of the bedroom, and um, <laughs> you know, because even if I'd wake up at night, then I found I turned it on sometimes, and then I'd be up for an hour when I shouldn't have been, you know, when I should have been sleeping. Excellent. Yeah. And I run on a 25-hour clock. You know, each day I could stay up an hour later, and oh. uh, so it's kind of it, from my ask my father, you know, <laughs> from my adolescence and so um so i feel like i fight that physiology part of it but um it is being it's mindful sleeping you know and i also think about stuff um get things out of my head or think about stuff i want to focus on because sometimes i feel like i problem solve when i sleep enough you know when i go into that deep rim and, uh, so so i appreciate your mentioning that because it does help support your digestion and then just all those good things. So in the morning, you'll have a good bowel movement and all that stuff. It's 
restorative. It's just restorative. And, you know, they talk about shutting down your electronic devices and not even having them like you. You move the television out, move your phone out, anything that might distract you. Um, sometimes mine dings. I can hear it from the living room going, what the heck? But it's in there, so I know I'm not going to go look. Um, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments? So um, a couple of comments in the chat um, mentioned gut health. So um, obviously a plant-based diet is gonna have lots of fiber, but anything else? What about eating uh, probiotic foods like yogurt and, and Only good. vegetables and things like that? Yeah, and, and our, you know, the prebiotics that we eat, which are in a lot of these foods, fruits and vegetables and grains, those feed our probiotics, the bacteria. So they're, they're all really good. And, People have asked, should I take a probiotic? And, and I think, you know, Dr. Todd said, you know, they really didn't work. And I remember uh, there was one study where they gave people something that disrupted their GI system. And they took, you know, sample of their microbiome. And then one, they just put back on a regular healthy diet. One, they did a fecal transplant. One, they gave probiotics. And the, the group that returned to their normal fauna or, you know, their best was the they just went back to regular eating, a healthy diet. Some of the others actually made things worse. Um, so the fruits and the vegetables, the fiber again, oh my gosh, we just cannot underestimate the benefit from that, the whole grain. So, but again, if we're not doing it, that's what we have to identify and, and figure out how we can start. But before you have to have belief, you have to believe that they're gonna do well. And I think we have the evidence, <laughs> you know, that's why. Sometimes when you talk about nutrition, it's like, what else is there to say? It's like, eat your fruit and vegetables, your whole grains, and limit your meat. And we've heard it a hundred times, you know. But, uh, but what stops us from doing, you know, what science says is really good for us? Maybe just even over-consuming of those. Just because it's a healthy food does not mean it, we cannot have weight gain from it. You know, if we overeat, I eat 2,000 calories of broccoli every day, but I'm only burning 1,500 every day. I'm going to have a surplus. <laughs> so, but the likelihood of doing that from high fiber foods is, is pretty low. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Anything else? Hey, Scott, go ahead. Well, I was going to uh, wish you luck, Janelle, with your uh, intermittent fasting. That sounds Thank great. You. I, I had really good success with that. Um, <clears throat> prior to about a year and a half ago, I had a really busy, uh, very demanding job. And my breakfast usually consisted of uh, coffee and some sort of pastry. And maybe I had lunch once or twice a week, uh, if anything. And I would, you know, go home late and just eat something just to put it in my stomach and never really thought about it. And I had become overweight. My doctor told me I was pre-diabetic. My cholesterol was doing wacky things. <clears throat> and then I uh, retired and moved to Palm Springs and um, got really serious about the intermittent fasting and the Mediterranean diet. And actually like, oh my God, exercise. <laughs> what was that? Like, <laughs> and I've lost uh, 40 pounds. Uh, and my uh, doctor says all of my blood work is normal and um, you know, cholesterol, the diabetes, the A1C has gone down. Uh, everything is back to normal. And I feel like more energetic than I, than I did when I was in my 20s. Excellent. So, Everybody, yeah. pat him on the back. You get a pat on the back from all of us. That is excellent. But it was a combination of all of them, uh, exercise, the intermittent fasting, the Mediterranean, and, and um, being more aware of my sleep and, and it, it all it's awareness. yeah so i wish you yeah. luck with that it's, thank it's, you very much i mean i did it for i don't know how many years and i don't know how i got away from it but it, it worked and uh, you know, i felt so good we have yeah. a, a, a colleague who's doing it as well and i'm sure there's other things he he looks great his skin looks radiant he feels great uh, and like you know so power to him as well Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Good luck to you. 
So, so is the intermittent fasting an ongoing thing, or is it a is it a regarded as something you do for a certain length of time? Well, I think if you are expecting to change things you want, then it has to be, you know, ongoing. It's not an unhealthy thing to do. It's just like, you know, you know how we can lose weight. And then when we stop doing what we did to lose weight, we gain it back. So to maintain, we have to continue. And it's not, and it could be like eating the Mediterranean diet in an intermittent, intermittent fasting way. It's again, it's just at some point the kitchen closes. And for some people, if the kitchen can close at six o'clock at night, they save themselves maybe 500 calories and not necessarily 500 good calories, healthy calories. And that, that's, you know, could be a 20 pound weight loss easily in a year instead of a 10 pound weight gain. You know, so I think um, you have to figure out what works for you. Is it manageable? You feel good on it? Why not continue it? But it's not crazy enough. The intermittent, it's not telling you cannot eat certain things. I think we understand, you know, eating ice cream all day, even if it's just between certain hours, it's not feeding our body. It's not giving us what we need to do. But if it's even less calories than I burn, then I will still lose weight, but I'm certainly not feeding this body, you know, to do what I want it to do. So grandma was right. You know, try to eat from the earth, try to let, try to avoid all processed stuff. Occasionally, oh yeah, fine. You know, you just know that, okay, I had some cake, I might have to give up these calories somewhere else, or I up my exercise a bit. It's all a compromise, but for me, it's better if I just say that's when I'm stopping. Because again, I can walk through the kitchen and just not even speaking, put something in my mouth. And if I'm knowing, okay, no, you now, four o'clock, you're shut off. And it, it's doable. You know, so what if I'm hungry occasionally? Just go to bed. <laughs> Get more sleep. I also yeah. found that the sugar, uh, I didn't, like you said before about all the food that's in, the sugar that's in food, we don't even know about. And, and I started becoming more, uh, paying more attention to that and uh, eliminating sugar from my diet. I, I, my big thing was I love to drink um, dairy milk and I, I would buy a gallon of milk and finish it in a day and I didn't realize that it had so much sugar in it. So I switched to uh, nut milk with the unsweetened version of like almond milk or coconut milk or cashew, you know, all those nut milks without sugar added. And mm -hmm. it gives me the same thing. I could put it in my cereal or my smoothies and I don't have like, you know, I'm not getting all that sugar, but yeah. I, I think that might have also helped with the weight loss too. Is is just. But I, I do want to acknowledge that the sugar in milk, the lactose, that is a natural sugar. So when you read the label, you're going to see total sugar. The thing on the label now is that it has to have a line that says included X amount of grams of added sugar. So cow milk, regular cow milk. We try to do low fat, non fat because it's a bad fat, but it's going to have like 12 grams of natural sugar in a cup. So it's just natural sugar. It's like in fruits and vegetables, there's fructose is a natural sugar, glucose is a natural sugar, maltose is a natural sugar. Now, if you have strawberry milk, you're going to see down there include so many grams of added sugar. And here's a good one yogurt. If you buy yogurt that is flavored or fruited, on average, it'll say includes like 21 grams of added sugar. Does someone want to compute, calculate how many teaspoons of sugar is that that they have added to that yogurt? And that's a cup. So you'll take the grams of added sugar, divide by four. So if you have 21 grams of added sugar, divide by four, how many teaspoons of sugar did they put in that? Five, more than five. So think, get your teaspoon out, get your sugar, or I use salt because it's, you know, this is my example, and measure out five teaspoons of sugar in an eight ounce container. That's what they've added to it. 
a soda has on average 10, 10 teaspoons of sugar in a 12 ounce soda. So again, on the label, because now they have to do it, though, but it pisses me off and I'm sorry to use that. They put it in grams. Who in the heck deals in grams? What does a gram mean to me? I, you know, tell me in teaspoons. I know what a teaspoon looks like. I know what a tablespoon, I know what a gram. So you take the grams of added sugar, divide by four, and that's how many teaspoons of sugar they've added. So we think yogurt is really healthy, but not when they've added all that flavoring and sugar to it. So we want plain yogurt. If you want to add a teaspoon of honey, you know, fine, a teaspoon of maple syrup. It still can be an added sugar, those things, but you're controlling how much has been added. So why not flavor it with your fruit? And if you're eating canned fruit, we got Christopher, you know, drain the syrup and use canned fruit to sweeten plain yogurt. There's enough sugar absorbed in that canned fruit to flavor your yogurt. Christopher, yes, go ahead. I always scan for high fructose corn syrup also. And um, when I was reading about it back in 1981, um, that's when I eliminated it from my diet because it starts showing up in fruit drinks. And yeah. I so um, a lot more things and in cookies and things that will show up as the substitute a sweetener mm -hmm. and um it's really terrible for us yeah and and, and again so you read the ingredients as well because that's where you see little things hidden as well and we all know the first ingredient listed is what's in that product the most right yeah so if it's listed first I was fooled one time I bought, someone said, oh, you've got to buy lemon pepper. It is so good. So I did. What do you, you know, think is the first ingredient in my lemon pepper? Salt. Oh. Yeah, I was like, whack, whack. Yeah. I said, oh, so they should have said salted lemon pepper. No wonder they thought it was so good. The first ingredient was salt. So see those manufacturers, they do not care. So you have to read those ingredient level, you know, read the ingredients, make your decision. And, and you all know how to use a percent daily value on that food label. Okay, if it's 20% or more, it means that you're getting a lot of whatever's on the line across. Okay, 20% or more, you're getting a lot. So what would be some things you'd want to have a lot? Protein. Protein. Fiber, calcium, potassium, vitamin D. Yeah, those things. When it's 20% saturated fat, sodium, added sugars, no way. And if you look on those little yogurts, the percentage is like 42%. So 20% is high. So 42, someone should be, be locked away. We'd all, you know, like Marie Callender, I'm sorry. I always say, if, if we would incarcerate her and shut down her factory, we'd all live longer and healthier lives. It's, it's just terrible what she's doing. It's criminal. You know, so 5% or less means it's a low source. So we want low in sodium, saturated fat, added sugar. You know, then you have that in between. So um, use that percent daily value to your benefit, you know. A quick comparison. Yeah. This is Jeff, and I just uh, do one last question, Scott. Go ahead, and then we'll uh, wind up. No, I just uh, about the labels. I just real quickly, I, I went down the aisle of the grocery store aisle of the cereal, the breakfast cereals, which are like there's like a thousand to choose from, and there's only one that doesn't have added sugar, and it's shredded wheat. Shredded yeah. wheat. Thank you. I'm going to pick yeah. some up tomorrow. Yeah, well, thank of course you. they have the frosted shredded wheat, but the and oatmeal. But and oatmeal. oatmeal. Sugar, every single breakfast cereal has like tons of sugar added to it. So it's getting and, and the you kids, know, that, like children addicted to it at an early age. Yes. Yeah, and I think to my parents, I think, how are you buying that stuff? And I think it's guilt. You know, when parents both went off to work, they filled the cupboard with stuff to appease their guilt, <laughs> you know, not being there. And it was junk food. And of course, you know, the healthy things you got to reach for or lean way down. So everything that's bad for you is eye level. So it makes it very convenient to pick it up. You know, it's, they really, you know, you just have to know they watch our money. Don't give it to them. You know, I don't have stock in those companies. I'm, I don't know if you do, but, you know, let's, let's go for sustainable. Okay. 
Well, thank you, Janelle. This is terrific. We really appreciate you. I hope, and I really appreciate, well, thank you. I appreciate your participation and your time. And again, I'm, I learned from you all, so I'm very happy, you know, to have hear from you. And thank you so much for that. Great. Thank you all for joining. All right. We'll see Good you next month. And just a quick announcement. Next month's program will be uh, June 1st, and it'll be Dr. Michael Gottlieb, who uh, many people remember was the uh, first uh, doctor to submit reports to the CDC about what later became known as AIDS uh, 40 years ago um, next month. So uh, he'll be there to kind of celebrate that anniversary. And he's been practicing, practicing ever since. Um, has done a lot of amazing work, like starting the, um, helping start the list not the Elizabeth Taylor, but American Foundation for AIDS Research and other groups. So uh, we're excited to have him and uh, hope to see you then. He's one of our medical directors even. Yes. For ACLA, yeah. ACLA. We're very happy, yeah. All right, thank you everyone. So much appreciate your time. Best to you all, thank you. Eat well and be well. <laughs> <laughs> all right, good night. Bye all. Go feed my kitties.